I wasn't going to be defined by the disability. I wasn't going to be Stu, the amputee to my friends and my family. I was just going to be Stu and I was going to be the person I was always, and I was always going to want to, to fulfill life as I would have done previous to the injury. Hi, I'm uh, Stu Croxford. I'm a veteran from the British Army. Lost my leg in Afghanistan and I'm about to set off on my next challenge to cycle from Land's End to John Groats. My life pre, pre the military, mainly sort of from a military background. My father was in the army, um, so sort of was brought up with that aspect in my life. And, used to love doing sport just uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sort of academic but I just yeah loved being active and um, doing as much sort of sport as I could yeah I went to to Manchester University studied architecture yeah from that I was just sort of thinking that was the career I was going to take I was sort of still linked in with a lot of friends joining the military and at the time sort of Afghanistan Iraq were kicking off and sort of really sort of unfolding so for me I think I just have this drive for for service and to be able to give back and uh, and sort of do my part so I actually decided to to give up the architecture career and uh, and join the military um, in 2007. The sport for me has always been a huge part of my life I think um, going to school that was very sports orientated. I always enjoyed playing hockey, rugby, and just staying active. Um, I was always choosing rather to be outside than, than sat in playing computer games or anything like that. I think it was just something that I just enjoyed doing. And then, yeah, sort of went to university and, and continued wanting to play sport, wanted to sort of push myself in different areas. Yeah, sport's always, always been there. It was definitely post post-injury um, where sport really did start playing a part of my life. The day I got injured um, in Afghanistan, I was, uh, at the time I was a reconnaissance platoon commander for um, Duke of Lancaster's regiment. I was um, attached to a unit, the Brigade Reconnaissance Force. The job we were doing was, was gathering intelligence on Taliban operations. We were always trying to sort of stay ahead of what the Taliban were doing to make sure they weren't able to, to sort of carry out those operations on on our forces. I was out with, with my, my troop at the time. Um, unfortunately, in one of my vehicles, when we were extracting out of the area after doing four days um, on the ground, um, gathering intelligence, uh, my vehicle hit an improvised explosive device, an IED. Blew up my vehicle, um, shattered both my feet. The explosion wasn't very loud, it was just this sudden change of colour uh, in front of me from the sand and I just remember in my in my mind just like over sort of whelming colour of orange um, in front of me. There was sort of no, no sound but it was just all I remember were these colours and then everything just sort of settled and then your mind's then trying to catch back up of, and working out what the hell has just happened um, and at that point I just was like I think I've just been blown up and I'm still looking at myself thinking, am I alive? The impact hit on the right side of the vehicle, so um, mainly hit my driver. Uh, he sustained severe internal injuries, um, had internal bleeding um, and lost his leg um, a couple of days after due to the uh, complexity of the, the blasts. For me, it was I was conscious through the whole thing. I'd shattered both my feet, so my my heel bones had um, gone into different pieces and I had quite a lot of swelling. Within 22 hours, um, I was back in Birmingham Hospital. Um, so straight through the, the system was unbelievable. I was sort of still shocked from the incident and sort of lying in a hospital bed with my parents and my girlfriend at the end of the phone, thinking less than a day ago, I was out commanding soldiers on operations in Afghanistan and now I'm lying in a bed uh, in Birmingham Hostel. So it was a um, pretty long pretty long recovery for me. Um, I had I think it was three years of recovery post-injury uh, initially. Unfortunately I had a second accident while I was in rehab which I snapped my leg clean in half in my tib and fib, developed a compartment syndrome 
um, which killed all my nerve and muscles in my leg. I sort of look back and think, thankfully it was my, my right leg. It was the worst leg out of the, from the explosion from Afghanistan. It actually just sort of forced me to make a decision. Did I want to live my life restricted and always thinking about the pain that I was in and the dysfunction of a limb that had sort of been the sort of hard point in my life that was always sort of hot, felt like it was holding me back. So I made the pretty hard decision to um, have an amputation. Um, so they amputated my leg two years after the incident in 2012. Being forced to recover properly um, after the injury in 2012 really made me understand my body better. And after the amputation, I was, I was up and about within a couple of months walking. I was running within six months. Um, I was back skiing again. Um, I skied on a prosthetic and completed my ski instructor training um, the first time I was back out on a ski ski prosthetic and and I was able to adapt and actually just that mindset again just looking forward and actually thinking what what did I want to achieve with this not what was being sort of held back from me or what I couldn't do anymore I was actually focusing on what I could do I wasn't going to be defined by the disability I wasn't going to be Stu the amputee to my friends and my family I was just going to be Stu and I was going to be the person I was always and I was always going to want to to fulfill life as I would have done previous to the injury. So after the amputation, I, I suddenly started thinking, I need a goal, I need something that's gonna, that's gonna really motivate me to wanna get fitter, to wanna get better on this prosthetic, wanting to understand where my sort of limitations were and where I had to adapt, but making sure I knew I could still achieve a goal that I'd always had. And while I was at university, I had a group of friends and we always talked about doing an Ironman, a, a full distance Ironman. There was a lot of talk about it and this was probably six years later, we'd actually done nothing about it. Everyone was le leaving, leading different lives. Um, busy in new careers and probably something that people had hoped had gone away and they didn't have to sort of dig out for. At this point I decided I was going to, just going to sign up for an Ironman out in Mallorca and I sent the confirmation email to all my friends who we talked about it previously. I thought you know what if I need to do it by myself then fine but if I've got my friends around me and they're on the same journey this would be yeah even even sweeter. At that point they they all came back and they'd all signed up they all yeah came came forward to the mantle and uh, we sort of went trained separately did our own sort of preparations for it it was just having that goal to actually be able to achieve something that I'd set myself well before the amputation well before my military career and thought if I can achieve this then my life's open I can achieve anything in the future so since the Ironman I've always been wanting to sort of complete a challenge and always have something to sort of strive for and keep myself motivated. I think it's just keeping that purpose. I think as soon as you haven't got anything, I think it can be very easy just to sit back and be, let life be quite easy, sort of coast through things. And I think you can really lose your way. So for me, having a challenge is hugely important. I've flown out to, to Canada to do um, an endurance paddling event, been out to South Africa, done um, one of the toughest eight stage mountain bike races in the world. And I've had an amazing time, but in the UK, we've got some amazing landscape. We've got some amazing um, opportunities to really push ourselves without having to have the impact of flying, um, having to, to go abroad and having to, to sort of seek those goals out. Actually, there is, there's plenty on the doorstep. Doing Land's End to John O'Groats would be, has always been something I've wanted to probably tick off but I've always thought, how can I do it differently? At this point, I thought the GB divide and sort of going back to sort of purist endurance racing. You're not racing against anyone else. You're not racing against, um, racing to finish at the finish line before anyone. This is, it's about pushing yourself to your own limit and understanding where you can push yourself. And it's, it's looking at self-sustaining throughout the whole event. So I think it's, a route of uh, 1,300 miles and traveling up from Land's End all the way through Cornwall and Devon and then through Wales as well. So you actually, you don't take the direct route. You actually start exploring some of the most insane scenery and landscapes that we have on offer in the United Kingdom. 
so for for the challenge i think um for me is keeping it as sustainable as possible i think is we've all got that responsibility now to to really think about how we're having an impact on the environment to do land to john o'groats completely self-sustained um is completely hitting that goal that i'd want to achieve for for a challenge but what really sort of I struggled to work out and I think is making sure that the the recovery vehicle so getting all the way up to John O'Groats I've got to get it myself back home and making sure that that transport back and using that support vehicle is is continuing on the same journey and making sure that the the environmental impact is minimized so during my military career I've had yeah sort of countless times and experiences of using um Lando defenders in different different formats we used um a thing called a defender wimic so it's a weapon weapons mount installation kit is what wimic stands for so pretty much it's just a weapons platform and the vehicle they choose to use is a defender for its reliability and robustness for me the experience of those vehicles um, was very rustic very minimalist i didn't even have a windscreen um, or a roof. So being able to live in those vehicles um, really sort of pushed you and you sort of had some pretty harsh environments to cover but you sort of always knew that the robustness of that vehicle was going to get you through as well and was going to support you. It's hugely important that the vehicle is, is, is fit for purpose, it's, it's going to support me through the challenge and also that it's it's going to make sure it has the least amount of impact and, and follows the, the primary goal of why I'm doing this challenge. Having that as a core structure of the vehicle is, is, is hugely important to me. It's, um, it really reflects back into my own military career and my own experiences um, of serving with the British Army. We've seen lots of different variants and um, using the Defender as a base vehicle and I think my time when we're out in Canada on the prairie it is completely sort of um, barren landscape. I mean I think there's there's like one tree on the whole place and um, it's the size of, this training area is the size of Wales. The vehicles that we were using had no roofs, no windscreens at all. Being able to look up at the stars at night and things, I mean, yeah, you were sort of in the most tough environment that you were being put through but also in the most beautiful setting that you can imagine and complete tranquility um, and and yeah having a vehicle that you could just sort of sit back and look up and, and see the stars was amazing. I think definitely since I lost my army career things sort of went upside down and um, I could have very easily have sort of stayed in the dark days and um, and really let it get on top of me but sort of <clears throat> having that drive to get back on top of the adrenaline and actually realizing that the purpose and the sort of life I felt through through that adrenaline sport was uh, was really key to my recovery.